Lafayette, we are here, the French history podcast for the American public by a Frenchman. Learn all about France's fascinating history, its great characters like Charlemagne, Joan of Arc, Louis XIV, or Napoleon, but also the great events that marked France, Europe, and sometimes the whole world. Lafayette, we are here, available wherever you get your podcast or on lafayettepodcast.com. À bientôt. Welcome to another episode of Cork Out History, where we drink Portuguese wine and we talk about Portuguese history, mostly the wine. My name is André and I'm Inês. Uh, welcome to Cork Out History. So here we are for the second part of Gracias Life. Hello Inês. Hello, hello. We're back as promised. Uh, hi André, how are you doing today? I'm all right. It's been a very busy, busy, busy day, but that's all right. Here we are. The good thing is we have another bottle of wine to open and some more history to discover. So we're in for something good. So we are going to feel better in just a little <laughs> while. We are, we are. Did I get it right that uh, we are going with the same bottle yes, once again? Yes, I actually had brought two of these bottles back from Portugal. We had the other one on the, the previous episode so yeah let's just open this one and we can start two bottles two episodes yes Here we perfect are. perfect we keep with gracia and we keep with tres bagos the wine we're drinking tres bagos or three berries is the flavor for gracia apparently life. so <laughs> shall we shall we start then shall we get back to where yes, we stopped last time? when we stopped she just arrived in antwerp wasn't that And her brother-in-law had just passed and left her all her fortune. So he left her half the fortune of the family, which would be would be expected to be hers. And then he left the other half of the fortune to her sister. But to be administered by Gracia, right? Exactly, exactly. That's where we were last time. That seems like a, um, a good place for the start of a big soap opera, right? Exactly, because as you can imagine, Brianda was not happy about this and it started a bit of a rift between the two sisters, which will develop and develop and develop. But this is not all. It doesn't stop here and just like you said, it turns into a proper soap opera from now on. So like we told you in the last episode, there was death, drama, evil forces at work and what else? What's missing from this soap opera plot? Matchmaking. <laughs> Matchmaking, matchmaking, matchmaking. <laughs> matchmaking. <laughs> so let's crack the story up a bit, shall we? We'll have the Emperor of Spain, Charles V, and his sister pulling the strings. I mean, why not, right? So here you have it. Charles V, I said Emperor of Spain, but he's not just Emperor of Spain. Because at this point in time, Spain basically owns half the world. Uh, Portugal owns the other half. Exactly. So we have the world divided between the two forces of the Iberian Peninsula. Anyway, we have Charles V personally involved in this matter. He's extremely invested and he keeps chasing his sister, Mary of Hungary, to persuade Gracia to marry her daughter to some Spanish nobleman. Why would he be so invested in this Spanish nobleman, you ask? Well, you see, things worked a little bit like an affiliate program, we can say. So the Spanish nobleman had promised the emperor a very handsome sum if he can arrange this marriage. And even though he's the emperor of half the world, he's still after that money. As always, if a man wants something done, he gets a woman to do it. <laughs> the king is so invested in this that he insists his sister goes to Antwerp in person, okay? To persuade Gracia of the marriage. So Mary was more tactful than her brother and was aware that pressing the widow could be bad for business. And so the two women engaged in a game where Gracia made all the excuses she possibly could to deny the imperial family and Mary just kept insisting. Right. So this game of cat and mouse reached a point when Gracia realized Antwerp was not safe for her family. Again? Yeah, I know, right? We'll be here over and over and over again it's like a closed loop unable to postpone any further and running fast out of excuses she told queen mary she would go for some short holidays with her family and made a show of going on holiday to the thermal baths 
And from there she ran away secretly to Venice. Drama apart, I kind of like her tour. Lisbon, then Antwerp, now Venice. I know, I know, right? For a runaway route. It doesn't sound so terrible, does it? No, but it, it, it does make sense if we look at like the, the Jewish safe. Well, I'm doing quotation marks because they're not entirely safe as one can see. But like the safest places after fleeing from Spain are her parents. I mean, yeah. And the uh, places change, and I think that um, uh, we'll see that Gracia's life really reflects that. Right. And it will just be like, as you are uh, saying, going from one to another to another to another. and um, Which doesn't speak very highly of <laughs> the ongoing political climate oh, for no. the Jewish population anyway. No, the times were terrible. We we have established that. Yeah. <laughs> it's that's not the, great that's anywhere. The, no, that's the starting point anyway. <laughs> and things got even worse in Venice, didn't they? Because when everyone realized that they'd actually escaped, Charles V and his sister actually put an embargo on their properties, right? Yeah, so on all the properties that they had left behind. Because it's like they realized they escaped and then they asked them to come back. Well, asked them. <laughs> They ordered them to come back, and they didn't. And then uh, all their properties were uh, put on an embargo. Again, we are going to see this over and over again. So now we have uh, Gracia running away, properties that are embargoed. Uh, and another figure that we need to mention is João. João is one of Gracia's nephews that I think Inês mentioned earlier uh, on the previous episode that would be involved with the business of the family, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it was one of those two nephews which we are not sure if they escaped, well, escaped, if they got away from Portugal with Gracia straight away, but if not, then they join her later on anyway. So that's when we mentioned them. And they will be joining the business side of things as well. And actually, João will be the one, spoiler alert, <laughs> that's going to inherit all of the family's businesses. So Gracia, Briander, her sister and their daughters arrived in Venice in 1546. As we know, Venice was... Well, not as we know, I hate saying as we know. But Venice was a lively market at the time and the, the relationship between Christian and Jewish population wasn't always friendly, but Jews were tolerated because, because of the business <laughs> that they bring to the town. That's how things go. Apparently, even with all their properties under an embargo, the sisters would leave luxurious lives. Um, because they had so much money. <laughs> even if there's an embargo, they still have much more money outside of that. So yes, they can still live in luxury. Yes, and this is also a time where we find Gracia by the name of Beatrice de Luna. She keeps on changing names depending on where she is. And... Right now, it would come handy to avoid the big, larger-than-life Mendes family name and to keep under the radar for um, Emperor Charles. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's not a foolproof plan, but considering this is the 16th century, it always helps if the, if the names don't match. Why not try? Uh, and it's like in opera, like, what, you know, exactly. when, they, when, they, when they pretend they're someone else by just putting some glasses on or something. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, or like, and oh, it's another person, no one recognized them. It's the same <laughs> <Scooby> thing. Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yes, that's it. Yeah, so that's what Gracia attempted in Venice. Lovely as it was, Venice wasn't meant to be more than a stop along the way in Gracia's plan. She had settled her sites in Turkey, where under the Ottoman Empire, Jews had a safe haven. Quite a contrast to these kingdoms, these Christian nations where she was going through. In her mind, Turkey just showed up as like the most secure place and it automatically it sort of became a goal so that's where she wanted to go because well because it meant safety and it meant that she could develop her business more during her time in venice she slowly started making plans and arrangements to discreetly start moving some of well whatever assets she could in direction to turkey however her sister brianda was not a fan of this idea. As we mentioned, there was a little bit of 
tension going on between the sisters at this time and she was fully enjoying their life in Venice and had absolutely no interest in continuing <laughs> to just run away, run away into uncertainty all the time. Also, why the hell was her sister still managing her money, making all the decisions, deciding to get her out of her luxury life in Venice into God knows where? Why was her sister still managing her life? Her dead husband was gone and Brianda felt that now she didn't want to live by anyone's rules anymore. She wanted to be her own lady. It was more than time for her to manage her own part of the fortune and make decisions for her and her child. She would not stand for being under her sister's grip any longer. Mm, I'm sure that Gracia wasn't too happy with that, was she? Gracia wasn't having none of that, obviously, and a major sister fight ensued. Right. Now, Brianda knew the odds were not in her favor. I mean, officially, Gracia did have the rights to control uh, the fortune, and uh, Brianda couldn't really manage anything. Not even the custody so, of her children, right? Yeah, which, you know... Tough. It, Tough. Her husband, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be happy no. with my late husband, to be fair. Yeah, no, no, no. There might have been a reason for it, but yeah. There could have been, but... And I'm just saying there might be a reason because I know what's coming next. I'm not judging her. <laughs> just disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer. I just, I just know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it's like, obviously, we have, you know, the hindsight and we know that Gracia is... Outstanding as a businesswoman, so I can underst- understand that um, uh, Diogo, uh, Brianda's late husband, would have left. Well, I-, I can understand his decision, and yet I can super understand Brianda wouldn't be Too happy. over the moon about no. it as well. Yeah, exactly. No. I mean, <laughs> Brianda knew the odds were not in her favor, and she wasn't likely to win a normal and fair fight, we shall say. So this called for desperate measures. Um, That's why I made that comment before. It's because of this desperate measures. Just to be clear, what did Brianda do? What did Brianda do here? (laughs) (laughs) So the crazy chick decided to go to the Inquisition and denounce her sister. I know. I Gosh, know she that's went like there. way beyond like any possible explanation. It's like I don't know what fight they were having, but come on, don't denounce your sister to the Inquisition. No. Sounds like a really bad idea. Not cool. <laughs> not cool, Brianda. Not cool. <sighs> oh. But that's that's the steps um, Brianda takes. So now after all this time running, we're going to have a Gracia that's going to have to face the Inquisition? Is this, this what you're telling me? Uh, yes. Yes. So, you know, after escaping everywhere, her sister denounces her. Great. How amazing is that? Great. We keep on running onto great family bonds here in this podcast, just so <laughs> it's another know. topic. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, it is. So it's actually me who's going to tell you what uh, what happened. And it did work to some extent. Gracia was imprisoned and the embargo kept on, on their assets. So it made everything harder to move and to do whatever she had planned. Usually what the Venetian... Uh, what shall we call them? The Venetian authorities... Uh, if someone was accused of uh, being a secret Jew, they would just be like, oh, okay, so... You know, we'll keep your stuff and get out of Venice, basically. These ones, there were, uh, Gracia was so rich, they're, they're like, oh, we'll keep your stuff, but you're not going anywhere. You're actually staying right here because we love having you here. <laughs> right. And uh, yes, mm-hmm. yes, you're like our trump card, you're staying here. Of course, that after this being the resolution for the case, the plan backfired against Brianda because both her child and Gracia's daughter were forcibly removed to a convent. That was another thing that came out of this, which just comes to prove that um, the Inquisition is never the answer, is it, Brianda? (laughs) So with the the assets that remained on Brianda's hands, she decided to move them from France to keep them away as further as possible uh, from her sister. And for this, she hired someone to denounce her sister in France as well. As if it was exactly, not enough. Because, you know, <laughs> once didn't go 
wrong enough. Let's do it again. <laughs> and guess what? Instead of only denouncing Gracia, this guy denounced both Gracia and Brianda. So she's having the time of her life. And <laughs> everyone's assets were confiscated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, slow clap for this woman. I think she managed to prove her dead husband right, actually. <laughs> and there we go. I wasn't being a judgy prick. I was just like, I knew things were coming. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I can see the steps that take to this place, but um, yeah. So... It goes without saying that their sibling bond wasn't at its best, and as their case went to court and Gracia lost, she was ordered to deposit half her fortune to be held by the Venetians until her niece and ward, Brianda's daughter, turned 18. How convenient, isn't it? Now, this actually turns Gracia Junior, so Brianda's daughter, in, into one of the absolute best matches in Europe. And, I mean... They already had to run away from Antwerp because the Emperor was all greed about her, so now she is even more desirable. Both being a woman and being a woman with money is is, is proving to be more complicated than it should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no winning. Being a woman without money is not great. Being a woman with money is better, but still, problematic still. Still, yeah. <laughs> oh. On the other hand, Brianda still wanted her share, since obviously this had gone nothing like the plan for her. And Gracia decided to send her agent to get her French assets back, while she secretly jetted to Ferrara, another Italian city, with her daughter Reina. So, everyone's moving around now. <laughs> they keep on moving around. It's not only now, they I keep know. on moving. It's just... Daring escape after daring escape. Yeah, and going back to me going um, all crazy on the sister, we know that in contemporary and some of the modern reports, often we have these two sisters depicted like as a binary, one that's great and clever and righteous and a great businesswoman, that's Gracia, and the other one that's Brianda, that's usually depicted as frivolous and wicked and less bright uh, and mean. Uh, of course, that we know that this is too simplistic to be true, and it's not a, a, a helpful way of looking at things at all. This is, again, what happens when we look with our eyes to historical situations and characters, and it never helps to get a clear picture of anybody. Better to, better to recognize that these women are complex human beings in all their glory than to reduce them to just like these two-dimensional characters that uh, we tend to do. Absolutely. Once we start like forcing morals and opinions into you know, historical characters and situations, it's really not helpful, is it? I mean, it is very tempting. And of course, like we as well are just human. Yeah, we need to aim to be as unbiased as possible. Yeah, especially understand that there's like, they all have motivations to do what they're doing. And yeah, we Exactly, it's yeah. just... You know, I don't think it's even, maybe unbiased is not even the correct way to look at it. It's just try to have empathy towards everyone. Just to, like, no one's a monster. Just try to understand why they're doing what they're doing, I guess. So this Ferrara, where they run to, was more friendly to the Jews than the neighboring Venice. And it's about this time that Gracia stops hiding as much that she's a Jew. Yes, we can sort of guess that uh, all this time Gracia and her family had been Jews in secret and just putting up the Christian front to, uh, you know, deal with the world around them. Important thing is that in I'm Ferrara coming. she comes out as a Jew. She uh, starts openly professing the I Jewish the faith. Want to know how to let it show. <laughs> Of course, we can't really say when this would have taken place, since these families had been forcefully converted and their lives literally depended on it. We cannot say what their faith or beliefs were beyond public statements. Now, when you are loaded like they are, everyone wants a piece of that. We've seen several states persecute, confiscate and try to get their greedy claws on some of that Mendes gold. But now, a Turkish envoy of the Sultan shows up. 
to help mediate the case between the sisters. Money, money, money. The time is actually quite terrible. It doesn't look great on Gracia's case after she was accused of planning to run away to Turkey. Which, I mean, to be clear, she was. But he does have some success in settling things between the quarreling sisters. Basically, you get some money, you drop some charges, yada yada yada. All should be good, right? Wrong! 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 Did we lull you into a false sense of security here? These are crazy times, my friend! <laughs> Expect the unexpected! <laughs> Just as things seem to be getting calmer, João, the nephew, goes on a weird limb that seems to defy all logic. He goes and kidnaps Gracia Jr. from the convent. I need I need a minute here just to say that I was just I was just, I need a minute for here for many reasons, but the one is just to say that I hadn't read this part that the, of the episode, and I you should all see my face now. You should all see my face now because I'm actually shocked by all of this. I wasn't expecting. We, I know we near said soap opera and whatnot, but like different this level. Is, I, I, I mean, yes, yeah. the warnings were there. Yeah, no, I wasn't expecting this. So he goes and kidnaps her. Right, great. But that's that's not all. Now I've read. <laughs> Yeah, so apparently the two of them run away, they get married, and they were aiming to get to Rome, but they got caught first. Why um, were they trying to get to Rome? I don't know, <laughs> just get away from it all, right, I Right, okay. <laughs> when interrogated at the hearing, Ju João, the kidnapper nephew, said that the marriage had been consummated. How old is this child, you ask? She has reached the beautiful age of 13 years old. Thanks to his connections, João was allowed to go free and he immediately vanished, leaving his baby bride relative behind. Well, this is starting to piss me off, you know? Because, like, this is <laughs> starting to sound just like this, this rich family that goes around making... A mess, <laughs> and they have connections everywhere. Very bad decisions. They have so connections much. everywhere, so they just get out of the mess and they just go on to the next mess. And and you know, like, oh, but carry on, carry yeah. on, tell us more. I know. Um, and I mean, it, it it's hard to follow, isn't it? I mean, what exactly is going on here? It's hard to say, really. I mean, trying to apply some logic to this sequence of events. A possible theory is that the family realized there was no way they would be able to get Gracia Jr. from the tentacles of the Venetians. They were gonna split the family, take hold of the fortune, and in an attempt to stop this, Juan would have taken baby Gracia, possibly married her? Maybe not? I mean, maybe he just said so and testified to the marriage and that it had been consummated to prevent the marriage from being announced. Right. I mean... Hopefully, I really hope this was the case. Um, was Gracia behind this? Was Gracia aware? Was Juan acting on his own? Like, what's no what the hell is going on? We really, we really can't get that from whatever records we have. <laughs> Everything is speculation. Yeah. Now, I mean, either way, at the end of this, guess who was pissed at this? The Venetians, of course. I mean, they were left absolutely raging, having their prized goose stolen away. They immediately condemned João and his helpers to death and put a major re reward on their capture. When I say a major reward, I mean it. I mean, they issued a very nice annual pension for life to whoever captured or killed him. I mean, not picky. Either or. Another layer of drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but João, in, in any case, João did escape this, so, I mean, good effort, but no. <laughs> so no, not only was uh, Gracia handling, dealing with, like, a stolen or not daughter and a prize on the head of her um, nephew or whatever, and not only that, but she was also <laughs> dealing with the drama still between 
the, the Inquisition and the agents of both Gracia and Brianda that were fighting each other and accusing each other. Yeah, I mean, the courts aren't going anywhere and everyone's accusing everyone, but everyone's... Accusing. Right. So in the middle of all this, Brianna makes another questionable choice by going into the court and saying that she and, and her daughter were now going to live openly and openly embrace Judaism, which I'm, 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 I'm struggling here because I'm, again, I'm learning this as long as, as you are, and, uh, <laughs> and that leaves the court in a bit of a tie spot, and they need to tell them that they need to get out of Venice right now. And so that's how they end up in Ferrara. I, I can't even begin to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that planning is not like, it's not anyone's uh, strength. No. <laughs> Basically, this just means that uh, everyone is now out of Venice and on to Ferrara. Now, after all this drama with the kidnapping and marriage and embracing Judaism, um, the next mention of our baby Gracia is when she gets engaged. <sighs> Guess to who? I'm not guessing. I'm not guessing one single thing in this story <laughs> from now on. <laughs> well, she gets engaged to none other than Bernardo Nasi, who is the other nephew. He's João's younger brother. I'm in shock. I can't react. <laughs> <laughs> so they're keeping it in the family, one can say. It is not clear if the supposed marriage to the older brother was an old or if they simply decided to ignore it, as it was now a Christian marriage and now they were, they had fully embraced Judaism, so anyway, she got engaged to the younger brother. So in Ferrari, Gracia would come to fully embrace her Jewish identity, as we said, and that leads her to dive into intellectual and cultural affairs as well as keeping her business going. So she begins hosting scholars and intellectuals in her house and becoming part of the Jewish circles at, of the time. And a, do, a good example of that is that she gets the famous Bible of Ferrara dedicated to her. I mean, I'm not sure how famous it is to, you know, the general public these days maybe but it is we can tell you we can assure you it is a big yeah. deal uh and it is a big deal because this bible was written in ladino ladino which is a language derived from old spanish spoken by the jewish population there and that's thanks to the forced migrations and for, for all these movements that, that we've seen, was a little bit everywhere, especially in the Ottoman Empire, since, like we said before, there was a large population there. It is still spoken today by some Sephardic Jews in several countries, uh, and there's actually a singer that I really like that sings some songs in Ladino, so we're going to be sharing that on Instagram. Oh. It's Yasmin Levy, she's an... Oh. Um, I think she's Israeli. Oh, that's wicked. Yeah. So you can actually hear it. Um, so we'll leave that on our Instagram. But anyway, this Bible was... Can, sorry, can you just repeat her name her again? Na yeah, Yasmin Levy. So, but anyway, going back to the Bible, it was written in Ladino. And two prints were made. One for the Duke of Ferrara and his family. And was obviously dedicated to him. And the other one was for the public and it was dedicated to lady gracia gracia yeah i know huge right like it's huge and even though i've heard of this bible when i was studying you had we didn't talk about her yeah yeah i know that's the thing anyway we're fixing that with our podcast and we are now talking about gracia hopefully. yes spotlight to gracia now it shouldn't come as a shock anymore also, Ferrara would in time become inhospitable and the Inquisition would reach there too. It was once again time to move and by 1552 Gracia would once again be on the move and this time on to Ragusa, which is modern day Dubrovnik. Oh lord. I know. <laughs> it's a long journey this woman's yes. on. 
Now, Ragusa was playing the neutral game, and much like modern day Switzerland, getting rich on the way. A master of diplomacy, Ragusa was neutral to both Christian and the Ottoman world, placing it in a particular situation which was useful to both. But again, as this fortune that preceded her, when Gracia docked, docked in Ragusa, she was received in great style, fancy ceremonies and everything. She was allowed to live freely outside the Jewish ghetto, and that's a perk that was not extended to everyone, but it was extended even to her agents when she left the city. Despite staying out of the ghetto, just a side note, uh, they would later pay the annual fees for the entire ghetto and get some deals going that would improve the Jewish community situation. And as often happens with her, again, the relation between her and the city was great for both. Good business for both of them. Gracia enjoyed privileges and she was able to conduct her business throughout Europe, which in turn was of course beneficial to the city itself. So from Ragusa to Constantinople, uh, an experienced traveler would take around 18 days. However, it would not be surprising to think Gracia's journey would probably take twice the amount. So now she was going to, she was going off into the, to Constantinople, was she? Yeah, because, I mean, the Ottoman Empire was described by some at the time almost as something of a, almost as something of a promised land where Judaism could be practiced freely and the Jewish population could live without the fear of persecution. Although the importance of this cannot be overstated, it is also important to highlight that this tolerance was in place thanks to the wishes of the emperor. The Jewish population had different and separate status from the remaining situation, from the remaining population, something similar as we had seen in most European states at different times. They were considered Dima, which means non-Muslim non subjects of the Muslim state, and they enjoyed considerable freedom to make their own rules in areas where the state was not concerned. And although their we can say inferior status was implied in the rules, this Dima status also meant that they were actual subjects of the empire and therefore they were protected by it. Right, and, and we're not talking about just any empire. The Ottoman Empire in the 16th century was one of the most modern in the world. It was a hub of ethnic diversity with outstanding administration that the Jewish population fit in well with this setting as part of the merchant class and they're traded with all of Europe, so um, they were key on that cosmopolitan um, existence of the empire as well. And it seems that the Jewish population there adapted well to life in the empire despite the challenges that this different lifestyle uh, and geography must have present. Going back to Gracia, there was a large there was a large population of Iberian Jews in the Ottoman Empire, and uh, in there they were able to express their either Portuguese or Spanish identities actually as Portuguese or Spanish Jewish populations. And it's 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 funny to notice that even being in the same place and all being Jews, they still kept separate um, synagogues and cultural lives for the Portuguese and Spanish. Um, Jews, so keeping keeping their own national traditions despite being in such a far away place. Yeah, far away and having gone through so much, yeah. and it will, seems like maybe their nationality wouldn't be really such a crucial part of their identity. But I mean, still, it seems otherwise. Yeah, still, yeah. they were Portuguese and Spanish. So little is known of Gracia's first impression of her new home when she first arrived. In terms of sources, we only have a report from the Portuguese ambassador to the Portuguese king Dom João III, in which he claims Gracia was sorry to have come to Turkey and would gladly return to a Christian country. Which is also just a report from a Christian ambassador on of Gracia, course, to isn't the it? Portuguese yeah. king. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, let's let's take it. Um, yeah, I mean, this woman sweated too much to get to the Ottoman Empire. I don't think she's, she's eager to willing come back. to go no. anywhere else. No. <laughs> no. 
yeah, and I mean, sorry or not, the next years in the Ottoman Empire would be the most pro- prosperous and stable in Gracia's life. After settling in Constantinople, her nephew would also finally be circumcised. Ta-da! Moment marking the final and full conversion of the family to Judaism. Yeah, big moment, isn't it? The area of this Ottoman Empire uh, at the time of Gracia was larger than the Habsburg's rule, and their military was also superior. Lots of things were, but despite their vast developments in things like admin and laws, their technology, especially in trade, was slightly behind. They still relied heavily in carts and carriages, and these wouldn't compare to the ships that were so common in, on, in the European countries. So, these Jewish merchants coming from the East with their expertise, contacts, boats, were greatly appreciated. A family like Gracias was a jewel like no other. Uh, in this front, so um, the Sultan went far and beyond when it came to them. Yes, he absolutely did. Uh, I mean, this is, even when they were still in Italy, he sent an agent, well, basically we can send, we can say a lawyer to help her get away from it. So here, he wa- he really wasn't holding back. Every and anything that Gracias wanted was hers. So... <laughs> Being a larger-than-life name always brings some unwanted, some unwanted attention, and again, it seems he wasn't over. I know it seems he wasn't over for them yet. So the Menj Nasi family. Um, so Menj Nasi, Nasi is another yet another name that uh, becomes associated with them. Yeah, basically the Menj Nasi family still had a lot of, still got still had some grief to come, this time from the part of the Jewish institution themselves. Basically, they weren't happy about their previous Christian ties. Uh, the, the Jewish establishment went to great lengths to distinguish between those who had been Jews their whole lives, from those who had been forced to convert, and those who remained converted a little while longer than absolutely necessary before converting back. However, I mean, after everything they've been through, whatever grilling they put them through seems to have been nothing uh, that they couldn't handle. I mean, they've been through hell, right? They've been through hell and they made it here, so just another step. There would still be more to come on the Christian front. Yeah, and now we need to mention the drama that took place in Ancona and Pesaro, because Gracia was heavily involved in that one. But to put it very simply, there were a couple of popes that had been relatively okay and benign on their rules, which had led the city of Ancona to become a large merchant center with a large new Christian and Jewish population. Then another pope comes along and the rules were changed as per usual and uh, there was another massacre that took place in Ancona in 1555 where 24 conversers died at the stake and many more were imprisoned and sold and the whole thing again. 30 of those prisoners managed to escape and found refuge in Pesaro, another Italian city. Yeah, I mean, what happened to Ancona shocked far and wide. I mean, even though we keep seeing this and this was happening, as we know, in other places, this still had a tremendous impact at the time. And uh, when Pesaro requested the boycott to Ancona, the trade, wor- the trade world was aflame. Now, this hit Gracia especially close. She knew many of the Ancona victims personally, her outrage was real, and she started a well-organized boycott to the city. Now, this was huge. This was the first boycott organized by Jews, let alone a Jewish woman. It is a rare act of organized Jewish resistance to persecution in the pre-modern period. That is the legacy of the Ancona boycott. Also part of that legacy was that the Gracia family was involved in the population Um, and restoration of two towns that were offered by the Sultan. Apparently, he offered them the towns of Tiberias and Safed, and the family was involved in in the development of those. 
Yeah, yes, and in regards to legacy, I mean, I know we've mentioned it before, but um, it's not only their b business ventures and their immense fortune and influence, uh, but especially their philanthropic activities and scholar interest. I mean, they were doing everything. They were building synagogues, hospitals, I mean, they were supporting the founding of a Talmudic academy. They were founding a printing press. Uh, they invested into manuscript workshops. They were supporting the arts. And last, but perhaps most important, supporting those in need and many Jews in distress. That was, I would say, Gracia's legacy. After the death of the Sultan, the Menj Nazi power would decline but Gracia kept her status and status and respect also because of this legacy until her death. Not so much uh, her nephew, though. Her nephew became very unpopular. He was too powerful and too rich. And by the time of his death, he had lost all of his sta status. But Gracia seems to have passed in Constantinople in 1568 at the age of 50 years old. Y you would think that from everything she's lived, <laughs> it seems like yeah, it should be much yeah. older. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to be just 58. It? Yeah. It's crazy how actually all of this happened and she died still quite early. So as we are going on about um, Gracia's legacy, it's important to note that um, some modern scholars have reviewed Gracia's life in anachronistic light and have claimed she was an early Zionist who helped Jewish and conversos escape by establishing an underground railroad and getting them to safety. Now, although there are some documents that show some Iberian families being able to reach safe destinations in Europe, and I mean, there are some vague mentions in Gracia's eulogies, it seems more likely that Gras helped some people get away through her outstanding influence and wealth rather than create an organized network or a system, as it is often claimed. She is an outstanding woman and she surely did a lot. She did so much. She went way beyond to help her community mm -hmm. in every way. And we don't need to add more to you know, it mm -hmm, force mm -hmm. yeah we but don't need to force yeah. the sources to say things or to just say that because they don't say are... it then it's because it they might exactly. have happened it's like and she, yeah it, that's one of the points usually claimed we uh, they claim that the lack of records reflects the necessary secrecy of the venture However, I mean, as it stands, we simply do not have enough material to, st to sustain such a claim. But she doesn't need to have created an organized underground realm to make, to help Jewish uh, escape. Like, that, what she did was already so outstanding. Let's not take away from that. that that's how I feel about this. Yeah, and that helps, that often happens with figures that are larger than life or that that can be used then for political purposes like as we were talking before when when you search for Gracia um, a lot of mentions um, come up of about her being an early Zionist and that's clearly taking a concept that would only come to be during the 19th century and applying it to the reality of the 16th century and of course it's useful for a certain political project to to do that but it's extremely unlikely that things like the cities that she was helping to develop, Tiberias and Safed, had anything to do with the ambition of creating a Jewish independent state. Like that's that's again what we said before, looking back with yeah. eyes. It's just going a little bit too far for the sources. True, she definitely established a mostly Jewish because that's her community economic center in the area of course that would benefit the jewish population and most likely increase her family's wealth but any claims that that go beyond that are seems to us at least a bit of a stretch we've seen this before as well like this uh, obviously when there's this level of persecution uh, the communities tend to, you know, rely on uh, on their own a lot more and they become more closed communities. But to go from there to declare uh, an early Zionist or to 
just get the idea of creating a Jewish independent state, that's, that's one step too far. We, I mean, we have no records in which Gracia expressed her religious or political ideas. Anything we can say on those grounds probably say more about us than about Gracia. I feel that what we have on her, what the sources tell us, is already more than enough. We don't need to add and go beyond the nope. sources. That's just speculation. Now, we need to bear in mind that um, Gracia's life was a remarkable one. In every sense of the word. She is way too outstanding. Her life is too peculiar. Her fortune too great. Interesting as it is, does not really offer as much insight into the lives and situations of other Jewish people. Or, let alone Jewish women living at the time. For there was nothing, absolutely nothing average about her reality. She is absolutely unique. And this is where we'll stop for now. Join us on the next episode. Until then, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Corkout History Pod, where you can reach out to us, let us know your thoughts, and discover more about the episodes. Don't forget to rate and subscribe wherever you're listening to us. Your comments really are crucial so that more people can find us. Bye! Bye.